So I want to start by telling you a story, uh, filling in some of the gaps that uh, you, what Kathy was giving that wonderful introduction, there, there are certain jumps that were made. And I want to kind of tell the story of some of those jumps, because it ha there's a story of what I call audience development in there. And uh, what you see up on the screen there, that's, that's me in 2001, my first headshot. And, uh, and then 2013, that's my most current. So we're kind of telling that story. And in 2005, actually just, I am coming up on my anniversary here of buying my domain name. So on July 27, 2005, janefriedman.com was purchased by me and it was under construction. If you visited it, you would not really find anything there except, you know, a guy shoveling. That's what it looked like in 2006. <laughs> That's what it looked like in 2007. And I, sh I should add here, at the time I was married to a PhD in computer science and I still <laughs> couldn't seem to get a website up. 2008, still under construction, but I ended up starting a blog as part of my job at Writer's Digest. And that blog was called There Are No Rules. Um, as a side note, that blog still exists today. It, was, it ended up being quite successful. And uh, it continues, even though I am not currently behind it. And I, I want to tell you about a, a little bit about that blog. That blog started in roughly 2008. And I... You know, I, I'm the worst person I know as far as how long it took me to understand how to blog well. So I would say it wasn't until roughly 2010 that I actually kind of got it, like understood what I was doing, what I wanted to say, who my audience was to some extent. But there was a big problem in my eyes with this blog that I was running, even though by 2010 I, I kind of had my groove, I found my voice. I really couldn't see much of the audience because of the way the blog was set up. It was run by my employer, and there were lots of limitations in their setup. So I couldn't really see beyond just numbers who was coming to the blog. I had no insight. And also, people who visited the blog couldn't find out more about me. It was just one page of, like, you know, when you, like the endless scroll. You could just scroll through all these posts, but if you wanted to find out more about who is Jane Friedman, unless you already knew, you wouldn't really be able to find out, at least not from that blog itself, which is kind of not cool. So there was like this huge question mark of who's writing this, and then for me there was the huge question mark of who's on the other side, um, and I wanted to know more about who I was reaching, but the tools weren't necessarily there. So that was always a frustration for me, even though I could see that it was gaining momentum. So because of that frustration, um, after I had the blog going for roughly a year, in March of 2009, I finally put something on my own site at janefriedman.com. And, um, you know, I can't show you what it looked like then because, and, and you know, I just don't have those kinds of records, but I drew a picture of it for you. It kind of looked like that. <laughs> And I was very happy <laughs> about how it looked. Um, so it was really nothing more than what I would call a landing page. There weren't, you couldn't really find much there except who I was. So if you happened to read my blog and you found a link to my actual personal website, you would find out my background. Um, but it was very basic, very basic. So. The traffic to that site was really quite low. And just to clarify, that line is zero. <laughs> Nobody was really going there. But it was there. That was an improvement over it not being there. Then in January 2010, I launched actually kind of what I call a real website at janefriedman.com something that was like more recognizable, and something you could actually click around and find something interesting. Um, I even, I took a trip to Ireland for two weeks and I worked on it alone by myself. I was, I was, I was going to make this thing happen without distraction 
and so it, it basically launched in very late December 2009, um, and I started sending people to it in January. So I want you to notice, it, it's really hard for you to read, but there were two little things on there that were really important to me, and it was a newsletter sign up because I wanted to find out more about the people who were finding me online. Or if people heard me speak at an event like this, um, I would send them to my website and ask them to sign up for my newsletter. And people did start to sign up, and it was, it was very positive, and I stayed in touch with them through email with various resources. Like if I went to a conference like this and did handouts or gave a talk, then I would make them available to people who subscribe to my email newsletter. So even if they couldn't come to my talk, they could still benefit from some of the information. And then I also did kind of a very occasional blog post. And by occasional, I mean I was undisciplined and lazy. And it was maybe three to four posts a month, if that. Sometimes it was only one post a month. But it was just kind of meanderings. It was not um, consistent in any way in its topic. I often just wrote about things I read. And that felt very satisfying to me. And of course, I still had the professional blog going on at Writer's Digest. So what happened to my website traffic when I did that? Hmm. <laughs> You, you can see where the arrow is. There's a slight, slight bump up from zero. It's getting better. And then by summertime, the, the, the line lifted just a little bit. And then after about a year, it, you can actually see there's like the blue line lifts a little from the black zero line. You know, so it's getting better. I was making progress. And it felt good. In July 2011, with my professional blog at Writer's Digest, There Are No Rules, by that time, I had about 60,000 visitors per month. And I would say in, in 2010, like I said, that was when it really, I felt like it really took off. But again, it was employer owned. So I didn't, I didn't own that traffic, I didn't own that blog, and for reasons I won't explain here, I decided to leave it. Now publicly, this is what I look like. <laughs> I, it's okay. I, it doesn't matter to me. I can walk away from this. But that's actually how I really felt. <laughs> so I started again at janefriedman.com. I basically, what I was doing on my Writer's Digest blog, I was no longer employed by Writer's Digest at this point. So I, I started doing the same thing, but on my own turf. And it, that was in July 2011. So if you look at that little number four, that's about the time where I started doing it on my own turf. And it started to grow. But you'll notice that's not 60,000. But I still was able to get a fair number at the beginning, people who were able to find me again. And after two years, we're now at the two-year mark, I'm back up to where I was. Now, <laughs> I'm not really here to like tout my, my success in doing that, but it's the story I want to tell of audience development. And how did it happen that I was able to get back to that level, or how is it that I, I just achieved that kind of traffic and it's, it's for a variety of reasons, but the most important is that I had this kernel of, of what I knew and enjoyed immensely. And for me, at, at that time, and, and currently, it's blogging, giving information to writers that has some currency. It's something that is probably uh, tied into the trends of publishing. So, the kernel, as I think of it, is some type of writing or content. And there are lots of different types of little kernels. Um, it could be a blog, but it could also be an email newsletter. It could be a Twitter chat series. Uh, it could be a regular column that you write for someone else, a podcast, a photo series, interview series, a review series, a reading series, an event series. There are so many different kernels. Um, and we're not all going to have the same one. You, you have to find the one that you like and that you're willing to stick with. And blogging is one thing I've been able to stick with for many years now. 
So if I kind of look at you know, the kernel of what I do, a lot of it is the blog itself, and then other things spin off of that. So Twitter is one, Facebook is another, there's my email newsletter which continues, there's the speaking and teaching that I do. And then you'll, you'll notice there's a tiny little circle in there that I, that I put, I put an arrow, uh, the Tumblr circle, that's like tiny, that's like totally insignificant to me at this point as far as who sees me on Tumblr, but maybe two years from now, it's gonna be a big bubble. I don't know, there are lots of diff I put out lots of different feelers, I experiment quite a bit, and some things grow, and other things don't. And you'll notice there's a really faint circle out there to the right, and that says book. Um, that's kind of one thing I just haven't done. It hasn't been that important to me to put my knowledge into a book. I might do it at some point, but for me, that's not yet where I'm at or what I want to pursue. But for someone else, in fact, the book might be the center. That might be really the kernel out of which all things spin off. And then you may be doing other things that are really relevant and valuable to you. And there's one author I know who the focus of much of his audience development is the book itself. And then he does a column for Forbes, which is very valuable, gets him a lot of new readers. He does a podcast. And Twitter is an important component of his engagement with readership. So this looks different for every single person. And you might ask, well, why isn't it just one big bubble? Why, why do we have to have so many time-consuming, stupid bubbles um, that are taking us away from our writing? Uh, which is a very valid question. And I think the big, the big reason for this is that people find you in many different ways. Um, what you're seeing up here is how many people find me through Facebook. It's been fairly steady from uh, one year to the next. But you see, over, in a year, roughly 35,000 people find me through Facebook. This is Twitter. A lot of people find me through Twitter. And in fact, the number of people who find me that way, it's grown in the last year. But there are other things where it decreases. So this is people who subscribe to my blog through RSS. That has gone down. So if I showed you like the 20 or 30 top ways people find me, some things would grow some things would decline, and that's okay. There's always a kind of, there's a, there's a growth and a decline with every single channel. But there's a diversity there, and it's a diversity that's very helpful. So when I left that Writer's Digest blog, I could still reach the people who were interested in what I had to say, and I could reach them through the email newsletter I started. Uh, when I put up my very first website, I could reach them through Twitter and Facebook and Goodreads. And so I've waited until now to really define for you what I consider to be audience development, and it's really a fancy term for directly communicating with your readers and not relying on someone else to do that for you or hoping that whoever owns that audience will share it with you. You want to, I, ownership is probably a bad word, but I mean it in the sense of it's not your publisher who holds the power there. You hold the power of knowing your readers and communicating with your readers. So what I have managed to do and what I try to help people understand is how to build that power of people around you to support your art, to support your writing. So some of the principles that I follow when I'm doing this, when I decide, am I gonna be active on Twitter or am I going to keep blogging? There are some certain rules. One is, um, I only do this when people give me uh, permission to contact them. So I don't send my emails to people who haven't explicitly given me permission to email them. Uh, I don't normally contact people unless they've already somehow shown that they're, they're looking for my information. I'm pretty passive about it in general. And I like this picture because to me it encapsulates a Zen attitude. Um, there's a sense where I'm going to try something for a while and I'm going to give it enough, the time it needs to either grow or disappear or show me some opportunity that I haven't seen yet. Um, what many people don't know about my activity on Twitter is that I started about a year before I actually started tweeting. <laughs> so I like sat on Twitter doing nothing for months and months and months. I didn't, I didn't get it. Um, I, was, I, I, never, I can't say that I really saw the potential in it when I first signed up. I was curious, 
but I didn't know what it was going to be. And then later, I got more interested, and I started participating more. And then I started to understand how I could use it uh, to help reach my readers and also the publishing community in general. So I'm patient with things. I don't force myself to understand something immediately. And again, I think I am the slowest person I know <laughs> in understanding how I'm going to, to use a certain type of tool. I also have increment, an approach of incremental improvement. When I launched that first website, it really was like a child's drawing. Um, but that was okay. It was just important to take that step. And I'm always incrementally improving things. Nothing is ever so-called finished. I'm always looking for, for new things to do and new ways to reach people. I have fun with what I'm doing. And if I don't have fun, then I generally stop doing it. And I think um, I should probably make this rule number one, actually. Uh, I think if you're, there's not a sense of enjoyment, um, you're probably not going to persist in doing it for the time it takes for it to pay off. And finally, I do periodically measure and adjust. I'm not like analyzing stuff every day, but you know, every three to six months or maybe every year, I kind of do a retrospective of what happened this year and what, was, what really made an impact and where do I maybe need to improve or what opportunities are out there that I haven't pursued in the way that I should. And one of the messages I've been getting lately is that I better put out a book because people uh, really want this, like this solid you know, feeling of information in their hands. So I'm thinking about it, maybe. So I want to pose a question that what if your efforts at audience development, whatever that might be, what if you reached just one new person per day? And what if one person that you reached told another? Over seven years, that would get you up to 5,000 people. But we know that you're not just reaching one person per day. You're not, and, that, and one person, it's just not one per person sharing with one person. It happens much faster than that um, because you get these little lightning strikes. Um, and by lightning striking, I mean like, for instance, when Michael Hyatt uh, created a link to my site on his resources page. That was lightning striking. I didn't seek that out, but it was a good luck thing that happened. Or when Google started to rank a few pieces of my content very highly, I, I got this huge traffic boost. Um, but I, I was only able to do that because I had put out good content that I believed in. It wasn't because I, like, I went out trying to game the system. I just did things that I trusted would be helpful. So it happens faster than just this. It's just, you know, doing the small things that encourage that type of growth. So if I were going to give you a list of next steps, I'm very practical in this way. I want you to go away with a few things to do. I would say the first is figure out what, what's the kernel of the thing where everything spins out of. It, it might be your book, but it might also be something else that's helping you reach new people, reach more readers over time. If you don't already have a website that's really yours, Establish one, even if it's just a line drawing. I really encourage people to think about starting an email newsletter long before they might actually have something to send, uh, just because it's very valuable to have that direct line to the people who are already fans. Number four, think about a social network you enjoy and might focus most of your energy on. Um, for me, that's often Twitter. But it doesn't have to be Twitter, it doesn't even have to be Facebook, it could be Goodreads, for instance, or Pinterest, or something else entirely. Pay attention to how people engage with you. And then finally, measure what's happening, adjust as needed, and don't be afraid to experiment. I, I have put out there many experiments that have failed, and I don't talk about them, so you don't necessarily know that they exist, but I have definitely failed a lot more than I've succeeded. So it shouldn't be, you shouldn't take it as something that uh, prevents enthusiasm later on. Um, you tried it, you didn't work, it didn't work out, and you probably learned something from it that will be valuable later on when you, when you do something that does work. So that's my hope for you. And uh, one thing I want to mention about one experiment I'm running, um, I'm going to be launching a digital magazine in the fall called Scratch. It's all about the intersection of writing and money. 
Um, and so it's a very, it has a very business slant to it. And if you're interested in finding out when the first issue launches, um, just go to the website, scratchmag.net, and sign up for our email newsletter. Right? Okay. Thank you very much.